I think the protecting veil made the kind of impression that it did because of its extreme femininity. I think the contemplation of the feminine is one of the most important things needed in this rather dilapidated time that we live. You know, one sees so many examples of aggressive masculine art, or even de-sexed altogether, emasculated might even be the word I would use. There is so much aggression. The protecting veil is very tender, and I think its simplicity, its femininity, its tenderness went a long way to making it the fairly popular piece that it became. I suppose during my life I have experienced quite a lot of serious illness. In my 30s I, I had a stroke. At 40 I had a leaking aorta, which was the result of the fact that my family possesses this gene. I think that these illnesses that beset one in one's life come as a sort of nothing God sends to us is evil, nothing at all. And in a sense, pain could be said to be all illusion anyway. But I think it's a way of knocking rather hard on us because we're so dense. It takes something like an illness to bring people, one could say to bring people to their knees. Anyway, I think the point is having an illness like that does bring about a kind of change in one's life. And I think these changes happen gradually all through one's life. They never stop until you die. It made me realize that, although I'd been married briefly before to a very lovely Greek dancer, we in a sense were far too young and I was too far too immature and far too interested in, in my art. Anyway, this was at the time of the stroke. At the time of the uh, heart surgery, my second wife, Mariana, she was a marvellous um, support. She was very strong. She had the strength of my mother. My mother was a very strong lady who had died when I was about 40. But Mariana's strength saw me through this illness and helped me to recover, and then I married her. And then uh, after that, I, I, I thought, what is all this, you know, about my precious art? I can't do this, I can't have children, I can't do that, and I can't do the other because of my precious art. Suddenly I thought, right, away with all this. This is total nonsense. This is living in the most ridiculously self-centered, arrogant way. Of course I can have children. Why shouldn't I bloody well have children? Bach had about 22 children. And I'm no Bach. Mariana managed to persuade me to have children and um, it has been a great blessing for me because seeing them grow up is something really rather wonderful and something that I'd never thought could possibly be wonderful. Patricia Rosario was brought to my house when we were looking for a singer to sing the part of Mary of Egypt in, in, in the piece that I'd written called Mary of Egypt. I remember she must have sung some gluck or some classical music, and I remember not being sort of particularly struck by anything. But then I put in front of her just a few notes of Mary of Egypt, and immediately she touched those notes I thought, this is the right voice. This is a voice that has a quality that I've been looking for and I'd not found in anybody else. And then she became really a kind of, um, certainly vocally, a kind of muse. And I wrote one piece after another for her. And I suppose in a way it's a bit like the connection that Benjamin Britten had with Piers or Messiaen had with Yvonne Lorio or Poulenc had with Bernac. And I think in Patricia's case, it's the fact that she's Indian, and I often tease her that it's not the fact that she's a Roman Catholic, but rather her Vedic or Hindu origins that are at work. It's the primordiality of her voice. 
It's the ecstatic quality of her voice. It's the non-English sound. Not that there's anything wrong with anything English, but the music that I was writing needed the singing of microtones, for instance, which doesn't come naturally to an ordinary Anglo-Saxon person. It's endemic in Celtic singers, whether they be Irish, whether they be Scottish, or whatever they be. And it's endemic in all Middle Eastern singers and in Far Eastern singers. And Patricia, although she hadn't sung microtones before, I don't think, was able to inflect because of her Indian background and the fact she had lived in Bombay all her life. This is the music she'd heard all her life. It was Indian music. It was part of her. And it was very essential for my music and particularly for the part of Mary of Egypt. I remember after the death of Princess Diana, Martin Neary from Westminster Abbey rang me up one day and said, I'm wondering if there's something by you that we could perform at the funeral. I think he mentioned the lamb, and I said, well, no, I don't think that's very suitable. I think much more suitable would be the song for Athene because that was inspired by the death of a young girl who was killed in a cycling accident. That's why it's called Song for Athene. That piece seemed to have a tremendous effect on a lot of people. I can only hazard a guess as to why it did, possibly because there's something primordial about it. And I think, after all, the death of that princess had an extraordinary effect on English people. You saw Anglo-Saxon people behaving in a way that they don't normally behave. They were coming up to London lighting candles. If it was a Greek, this would be understandable. If it was an Indian person, it would be understandable. If it was an Irish person, it would be understandable. For, for Anglo-Saxons to be doing this kind of thing, it must have had a very big effect. I don't think it was a great grief for the princess who had died, but rather a grief for themselves, and that they need this kind of things to open them up in some kind of way so that they can be truly and utterly receptive. And possibly there was something in the piece that I wrote, Song for Athene, which touched the primordial depth inside them. Mm -hmm. 